This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. This is Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And that song is, I think, Over the Rainbow. I think it was about Julie Garland or something like that. It's a long time ago. But the reason we chose that song is because many people actually believe if I get rich, then I'll be happy. Or if I meet the man or woman of my dreams, then I'll be happy. Or if Obama or Hillary gets elected, then I'll be happy. And that's really not the real life here. And so that's kind of, you know, fantasy land. So our guest today is Mike Lindell. Now, for those of you who live in America and primarily like Australia, New Zealand, and now England, you may know him as a gentleman with My Pillow, one of the most successful product launches in history. And everybody knows who Mike Lindell is in America, Australia, New Zealand, and, and now England. And he's the inventor and um, CEO of My Pillow. He's an entrepreneur, speaker, and author. And my Pillow is American made. They employ over 1,500 in his home state of Minnesota. Imagine that, 1,500 employees. And many of his employees are recovering addicts. So this man is doing a lot of social good. He's doing a fantastic job. But we're gonna talk about here that just because you're successful and rich doesn't mean you're happy. And so Mike's gonna talk about some of the challenges he's had, some of the ups and downs he's had but more importantly, the perseverance to keep going. Any comments, Kim? Oh yeah, this is gonna be a really dynamic show because Mike is quite the character and uh, quite the entrepreneur. <laughs> he has an incredible story to tell. And uh, Robert, as you're saying, for on anybody who is an entrepreneur or is thinking of becoming an entrepreneur, this is gonna be a great, great, great show because yeah, there's a lot of ups and downs that you face as you, as you build your business. And uh, Mike has seen the ups and the downs and uh, he sold to, he's now sold 45 million my pillows. Imagine that a category million. called pillows. I would never have thought <laughs> of that. Forty-five million, most and infomercials, Kim, TV. Kim and I own two of them. <laughs> we do so. social media, radio. He's uh, he's everywhere. So, uh, Mike, I'm I'm so proud to have you mm -hmm. on our show. Thank you for being here. As a dear friend of Donald Trump, and which gets him into a lot of trouble because <laughs> a lot of people hate Trump. Even though you know, I mean, Mike Lindell employs fifteen hundred people. And the people that hate them don't employ anybody. I mean, imagine that. So, Mike, right. are, you, are you an overnight success? I mean, it was just <laughs> said one day, wake up and say, oh, I need a new pillow. And it was overnight success. Is that your story? No, that's not my story. Um, thanks for having me on, you guys. But they, it's, uh, so my, uh, you know, we'll go right to when I invent. I was always an entrepreneur, but I never had, I never had any money. I never was able to use a, a bank and, uh, so I would, uh, if I if I'd see a need for something, like my sister flooded a third story building of a waterbed back in the '80s, and I became a carpet cleaner. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, my uh, I worked at my uncle's farm in Iowa, and he, uh, I said, why is he getting all the money? I I can go raise these pigs, and I I went and bought feeder pigs, and uh, I put, they were at an all time high, and I bought them, borrowed from a, money from a bank, and that time I did borrow some money, and. Uh, my, um, we were in like, we were kind of across where rural comes into urban, a neighborhood. And we've, I put all these pigs there and they, uh, um, I had all kinds of problems. They'd get out all the time into people's yards. And <laughs> well, anyway, they, the bottom fell out of the market and I lost everything. Um, they, um, but they, uh, and different things. I was a professional card counter. I owned, I owned bars, restaurants where, you know, I would just, I wouldn't have money, but I'd buy them on contract for deed and very, very driven and, when I invented my pillow, um, when I spent a year and a half inventing it, and and when I did get the first prototype already, I go, wow! I have a pillow now that you can now adjust. You can wash and dry it. It lasts ten years. It, but more importantly, it gives you the best sleep in history, where you move it and it holds there. It, it's like it's like a customized pillow that you can adjust for yourself. Well, what well, what caused box stores, what caused you to I invent walked, the thing? What, what I mean? What caused me to bend is I had the same problem. Every I found out everybody has. I couldn't. I couldn't sleep, and it wasn't just because I was a cocaine addict. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll get into that. Was, we'll uh, get into that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I couldn't sleep. My pillows would go flat. I'd use my arm. I'd wake up with headaches or neck aches. 
Um, I would uh, I was seeing a chiropractor. I'd come back, and three days later, it'd be bit, you know bad, uh, hurting again. And I knew it was uh, pillows. I knew it was about height, not firmness. Everybody wants a soft pillow, but they want it to stay there. Like if you adjust it for your neck, for your height, it's about sleeps about the distance from your head to your bed to hold that there. And and that's, you know, down pillows being the worst where you use your arm and your pillows collapse and, and uh, you know, you end up sleeping on your arm and your arm goes to sleep. But it was, that was the main problem. It was, uh, it was, it was, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to be able to adjust. It's the only product ever sold where we all have different shoe sizes and shirt sizes why don't they give us different pillow sizes or for heights and that would stay there? So when you invented so, it, did you did you was it immediate success? Did you put it into stores? What did you no, do once you invented no, that, it? That's right. Right. That's what I'm saying. Once I got the prototype, I went into actually it was a Bed Bath and Beyond store. I went in there first. I said, you know, I go into these, and then I went into multiple box stores. I went in there with such passion. I have the best pillow in history. Where's your buyer? Where's your buyer? <laughs> One of the stores said, um, you need to leave right now. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you, are, you, are, you must be on drugs, you know, I, but I wasn't that day. And they, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so they, um, you know, that or, yes, I am. But um, um, anyway, I, I was turned down everywhere, and someone said, Mike, why don't you do a kiosk? And I said, how do you spell that? <laughs> and I, and uh, I ended up doing this kiosk. I didn't work many of the days. That I mortgaged my house. We were completely broke at the time. We had four little kids, and um, I went all in. And there was there was one guy I sold a pillow to there, and he he said, "You have a business card." I said, "Oh, I'm all out." And I wrote it, my number on a piece of paper. And he happened to call in January of that year, and he said, "Are you the guy that invented this pillow for you from Minnesota?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, I run the Minneapolis Home and Garden Show." He said, "This pillow created a miracle in my life." It changed my life," he said. "Can you? Uh, would you get? Would you come in and get a booth? Have a booth for my show?" I said, "Sure." And I and then I went into the show, and I actually set the booth up differently and, um, and with a table out front because I couldn't talk to people back then. There was I had a fear of unworthiness, rejection, going all the way back when I was a kid. So I was kind of very introverted at times. Well, anyway. I, but being behind that table, I could start, I, st- I could talk to people. I started selling, and it just took off. It exploded that day. I, I got in the Minnesota State Fair, and I did shows and fairs for like mm-hmm. seven years. Wow. And and uh, to, but very you know going show to show and fair to fair and selling it anywhere anywhere there was people. But it was you know, and during that time though, that was a parallel railroad track. I was also then I was into crack cocaine. I was a crack addict, and so if I wasn't, you know, obviously I wouldn't be doing drugs at the shows, but it would be um, stealing from me and betrayal, and every, all these other things were happening. But it, so as you were as you're building this business, as you're building this business, and you're going to all these shows, and you're going to all these fairs, and you're selling all these pillows, you you were a a, a, a crack a crack addict. You must have been yeah, full blown, wow. full blown, and I had to pick and choose. You know, if I did if I did the shows. I couldn't. Nobody could. Anybody that took, been a crack addict, you could, no way. You get too paranoid. You're peeking out windows, and and but I would do. Uh, you know, um, I would not, I would refrain from doing it. I, I never broke trust with the show promoters, but I lost a 20 year marriage. I lost um, um, the company was just a pulse at times because I people that I broke bread with would try and steal it. I had other other. Um, uh, a manufacturer that came in and said, "Hey, we can manufacture this for you." Um, you know, I was very fortunate to get a patent, so at least I could always make my own pillow. But I was told that that I better get a patent because I would be because it lasted ten years, and it was um, that if I didn't get a patent, that the big the big companies would go behind me and get a patent. It'd be like the cars that got two hundred miles a gallon; they would never put it on the market. And but I, you know, I just I ended up quitting crack at January sixteenth, two thousand nine, and and that we can talk about that in a second. But they, but then I getting my I, there was nothing left, and I got I went to get my company back. So on January sixteenth, two thousand nine, I quit all my you know I was the pillow company. I had it was down to just I had basically lost everything. Where I was just doing a few shows and these guys that had working for worked for me. They copied the pillow, and they were they were taking everything. 
Um, and it was it was uh, really it was getting really bad. And they so your own employees um, ripped I, you off. Yeah, yeah, they took and they they decided to leave. And I was kind of an addict. I never. I wasn't an addict you would think of that would use people. I gave them the shirt off my back. I was always a giver, and they decided that they, you know, I, that they would basically steal the company. I had another company came in when I tried to uh, actually have people buy into the company, and they did that, and they fired me at the first board meeting. Um, you know, it was, uh, you know, everybody tried to take my pillow. They tried to take it, either the manufacturing, copy it, take, steal it, I mean, and, uh, but on January 16, 2009, when I quit everything overnight, all my addictions, and I prayed to God, I said, to free me from these and not have the desire. And, and anyway, uh, to add this story, so I wake up the next day and it's gone. And I did end up going to a faith-based treatment center a couple of months later. But, but I, at that time, I was so, I felt so relieved that I, and, and uh, I just wanted to go, Get, get my company back. Every I didn't have any money, nothing left, but I had to get thirty thousand dollars to buy back my fabric from the guys that had taken my that were taking my company. And I went into these guys I didn't even know a week later, and they were they were all wearing suits. I was really afraid of guys that ate with two forks or more and 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 more suits. And uh, so they because uh, I had this fear of talking. By then, you know, coming off drugs, I couldn't talk to two people in the same room, but. Anyway, I walked into this meeting. I didn't even know these guys to borrow thirty thousand with no collateral, and uh, and I, I walk in there and there's eight of them. There's a CEO, a CIEIO, a CFO, all these C's, and I'm going, <laughs> and I'm wearing a, I'm wearing a, and they're all wearing suits and ties. I'm wearing a t-shirt, holding a pillow, and uh, with three <laughs> jars of my patented foam, and they go. I said, yeah, I want to borrow thirty grand, and uh, I'll give you forty thousand back in two months, and I'm going to do home shows and fairs like I used to do. These guys took my company and all this. They're t- trying to take my copy my pillow, and and I said, I need that thirty grand cash to buy my fabric back. I used to be a crack cocaine addict. I'm going to do shows, and and the one guy goes, the one guy in the corner goes, well, when did you quit crack? And I said, last Thursday. <laughs> and he got four of them. Four of them got up and left the room, and the other four sitting there listened to me. But I had such passion; it was so much be- believable. They ended up doing it. Wow. I think God just said, "Here, this is a divine appointment." And um, I wow. walked out of there. They didn't even check my license. The reason I know that is because I didn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> but they, so, uh, so did- there was, uh, but then then it got up to Jan- on, on December on October seventh, two thousand eleven. Um, every, you know, I started doing home shows and fairs again. I said, you know what, if no one's going to take my pillow, I'm going to bring it right to the people and I'm going to do an infomercial. And we went to film it on the night before we filmed it in August of 2011, a friend, or I mean, they brought in a real producer and it, we were doing our reads and the guy said, he texted the other guy, said, this is the worst guy I've ever seen. He's never going to make it on TV. Why did you even invite me here? And, wow. and, they, but wow. I, and we, uh. But it aired October 7, 2011. I was living in my sister's basement, and and I had like five employees, and 40 days later, I had 500 employees. After the infomercial aired. Yeah, after what a, aired. What a, what a really, it. really great story, you know, Mike. And you know, I, I, what, I, I, what I appreciate is the forthrightness, because one thing about the Rich Dad radio shows, we say it's the good news and the bad news. And a lot right. of times people only tell the good news. You know, one day I was broke and the next day I'm a multimillionaire and yeah. I'm, I'm, my life right. is perfect, well, then, well, then, everybody's happy, which is a bunch of BS. So I thank oh, you for absolutely. being so now, forthright. Let me, let me, wait, wait, right. Mike, Mike, we got, we got to go to break. So hold, hold what you're going to say. It's a fabulous story. And I just want to commend you and thank you for being so forthright. When we come back, Mike will be going more into what he's learned, but most importantly, you guys are hearing it from him directly. And guess what? The story gets worse. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. Robert Kiyosaki of the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And the reason we play that song, Over the Rainbow, is so many people live in la-la land somewhere over the rainbow. If I do this, then I'll be happy. If I become a millionaire, I'll be happy. If I vent this product, I'll be happy. If I get married, I'll be happy. And those days really do not exist. So today we're talking to Mike Lindell. He is the inventor and CEO of MyPillow. And again, we're an international program, and MyPillow is one of the most successful products ever made. And it 
Mike took a pillow, which is something most of us have seen and used, but he took it and built a multimillionaire business out of it. But it's not really about the pillow, it's about the process of being such a fabulous entrepreneur. So once again, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android. And all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive it because repetition is how we learn. So if you listen to this interview again with Mike Lindell, inventor and CEO of MyPillow, and especially if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be happy, or you're a crack cocaine addict or whatever addict you are because everybody's addicted to something, you listen to this program again, you'll pick up even more the second and third time. But more importantly, discuss this program with fans, family, and especially business associates, especially those are, who are stealing from you. You've got to be very careful today. So once again, that's at richdadradio.com. This program is archived. Any comments, Kim? Well, what I like about Mike's story is, you know, similar to how we started with Rich Dad, Poor Dad with the cash flow game. We did cut things kind of backwards because people said, this is the way you're supposed to do it. This is how publishing works. Or this it'll is how, never work. This is how the if game industry it, works. If you build it, people will they come and, and all that stuff. And we, all the doubters. Yeah, and we went against everything that they said. And this is what Mike's been saying. He's went up against everything that people are telling him how to do it. And he's like, I'm going to do it this way and even in the infomercial business i mean you're one of mike you're one of the most recognized people in the u.s because of your of your infomercials they're everywhere and on the radio and everybody knows you and recognizes you and i did right, i did right. infomercials too mike and then the, the producer said the same thing because i got into a fight with them. they wanted you to read a script yeah. and mike doesn't do a script right, right? right. and, and right. I, I said look i can't read no it wasn't that <laughs> I said, I refuse to say what you want me to say. I refuse to say it. And he and right. I went toe That's what to toe. I, I go, yeah, I go through that. And, you know, you know, back when we did that infomercial, we went, he, he wasn't too far off. We went out there the next day to film, and there was a real audience and a friend of mine. And I was, I was so scared. And they did have a script. And I said, and I, it took nine takes to read that script for one line. And I said, I just want to do this naturally. And I, I want to make it, like, real to the people, the yes. truth. and. And we did it, and uh, um, we we did it in the one day there. And, and now what happened, though, was I just wanted to make pills. And they go, Mike, we exploded from five to 500 employees. They go, Mike, you need to be CEO. I go, why do I need to be a CEO? I just want to, we got to get these pillows out. And we need an <laughs> HR department. I said, that sounds horrible. We need a corporate attorney. I said, that even sounds worse. <laughs> and, uh, and we took, uh, and we took, uh, um, in the next six months, I took in a hundred million dollars. I called my friend. I go, Tom, do you know the ATMs don't go to the fifth or the seventh digit? He <laughs> goes, No, Mike, I didn't know that. Well, I, it was just surreal for me. But at, when the dust cleared in June, I was almost six million in debt, and I didn't use a bank. And I'm going, God, I said. What am I? I'm praying. I'm going. What am I? What am I going to do? I can't. The rest of my life is ruined. What, what, so what? What, hap what? What happened? How did you get from a million dollar what, revenue to six right. million in the hole? Well, what to a hundred million? I took in six million. In the hole. What happened was I went to companies and I said, um, "Is this the best deal you have?" I said, "I'm going to sell." I predicted I would do that much, and nobody could believe me. So they go, "Oh yeah, that's the best price, you know, for that." So I didn't negotiate prices, but more important is we were buying media. And nobody knew if it was the right media. I had other people doing that and other companies doing that. So basically, it was kind of like greed on steroids. Everyone was being greedy. Everyone was going, wow, taking advantage of this, of this phenomenon this, that no one's, no half or infomercial had been that successful at that time ever. And anyway, with that, but I'll tell you what, if you're an entrepreneur out there, any deviations or blocks deviations is what you really got to look at and i looked at 2012 and i took everything in house all my own advertising everything every spot everything is, is done now it comes right through us where we track every single <clears throat> every single outlet like it's my like it's our only business i remember when i had no money on the road so like let's say it's a let's say it's a newspaper in dubuque iowa i might uh um, I'll treat that just like it's my only one. And if it doesn't make its number, if it doesn't break even or make money, I don't run an ad in it. it and uh, if there's a spot on TV, it either has to break even or make money a little bit. And and I learned so much from 2012, which would have been that anyone else would have said, this is devastating, it's over. 
And we just picked everything up and just moved on and learned. And it took a long time to dig out of that. Um, but we did dig out. And and then I, it got to be 2014. And I, and we did a one and a two minute commercial. And then I started, I did print. Everything I did was different. They go, Mike, you need an actor to be in your in your thing. And I said, why? I don't have money to be to pay someone, some some big star to be in there. And I said, you need to brand. I said, I don't have money to brand. I, I, I need to make, you know, to, to make money here. Well, they, and then they did a newspaper ad. And instead of having some lady, beautiful lady, acting like she's sleeping on a bed or a pillow, here's some, here's some geek holding a pillow, some guy going, you know, the most comfortable pillow you'll ever own, you know. And, but people, re- they resonated what was real. And I wrote, the, I wrote the ad myself, a newspaper ad. PR companies are calling me going, what, did you write this ad yourself? This is horrible. We can make you so much money. Yes, yes, and I'm yes. Going, and so this, so we learned, I just learned a lot from that. And then, and we, once we got back and then I, I just, um, things, you know, doing all our own advertising and keeping control on it and be a micromanage and macromanage, but, um, being able to, as an entrepreneur, to learn those deviations, and and by the way, my my, my the patents. When you get a patent, um, the patents are important because you can at least always make the product yourself. That my pillow would have been shut down a long time ago, and they would have never put it on the market because it lasts ten years. But but um, I always tell entrepreneurs there is no better time than right now, especially in the U.S. because. Everything with jobs up so much now and wages, you have a safety net that I didn't have or that not many people have, have like they have right now. You can go out. I see entrepreneurs taking chances and inventing great products and tra- getting into business for themselves because if they fail, they can go get a great job anywhere, you know, and that's what's so nice to have that now. But otherwise, people live in fear. And when you when you said before on your show about entrepreneurs, uh, you know, once you get like right now, I have. Um, 1,500 employees we take in. We're a half a billion dollar company, and and I, I haven't changed. And I'm for me, my happiness lies in the fact that um, I have so much passion for people. Say, Mike, how do you have this much passion for a pillow 15 years later? Because it helps people. I love helping people. That's my calling. My pillow is just a bigger platform anyway for God and for evangelism and and helping addicts you know, give and back. And you you actually so employ rewarding. you actually employ uh, many re- recovering addicts, don't you? Oh, absolutely. And I've got a network starting now. We're across the country with the president's help and and the, and the administration helping addicts. That's that's my thing. I want to wipe out the opiate addiction in this country oh. and. Uh, with it, with it, just as fast as it came on. Well, what, yeah, well Mike, Mike, Mike. One of the chances. one of the great stories I heard about you is that the guys you used to buy the crack from finally became they rescued you too, right? They cut you off your own suppliers. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that, that's a great story. So back in two thousand eight, um, you know, and you and anybody out there, everybody's got dreams, and, and and we, but we don't. I think so many people have lost hope. I never lost hope, but it was. Uh, and, but it was in two, it was in March of 2008, and uh, I was downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I was I had been up for 14 days doing crack, and and things were so bad. Usually, I would try and stay up until I got things solved, but that time it wasn't working. And I came out of a, I was downtown, worst part of town, and I came out of the bedroom or bathroom, I guess, and all three of the biggest drug dealers in the cities were standing there and they knew of each other, but they had never met. And I go, what's going on? They go, um, you're getting cut off. I go, what is this an intervention? They go, you, they go, you call it whatever you want. And the one guy said, he goes, I, he goes, he's not getting my, anything from my guys. And he left in disgust. The other one went down to the street so, and it was his house and he never came back. So now I looked down, I had a couple crack rocks left and, and I smoked him, and the other the other guy that had called the intervention, he fell asleep. So at two thirty in the morning, I went down to the streets, and I could not buy crack anywhere. They had gotten the word out. I, I was I come upstairs an hour later, and I walked in, and he, he's sitting there, and he goes, "How'd that work out for you?" And he goes, "Give me your phone." And he took a picture. He says, "You're going to need that for your book." He says, you've been telling us for years that this pillow thing is just a platform for God, and you're going to come back and help us all some days get out of this, uh, get out of this addiction and this world, this this uh, a world we're living in down here. 
And it's interesting enough because it has come full circle. Those two of those guys work for me now, and they've wow. been saved, and they're they're working for me. They're drug free. They don't deal anymore. And it's uh, but I did back then. That was my dream. It was my that was my dream was to even myself. I knew that that I would end up getting off of drugs because and uh, but I had. Uh, you know, that was my dream. Yeah, it wasn't great, like at that time great, going. Great, fantastic. That's a great story. Right. Such a hey, great Mike, story. Mike, yeah. Mike, I've one more story I want you to tell. So congratulations. You know, that's really the, the best story ever is you help each other get off your addictions. But also, <laughs> your advertising has caused problems with the Better Business Bureau, the state of California. And they want to, they, they come after you no matter how much good you do. These jo- so-called and jobs elites you come create. after you. Jobs I mean, you create, create all these jobs yeah. in Minnesota, and the Better Business Bureau of Minnesota comes after you. California comes right. after you. They want to shut you down. Yeah. What's, hey, what, what's, what's add, with all that? One more, let, let's add one more crooked group to that. That's called truthinadvertising.org, the most corrupt group I've ever seen, right next to the Better Business Bureau. Now, I didn't, uh, now back then, in 2016, I met Donald Trump before he was president. He reached out to me in a private meeting, and, and I, I walked into his office, and I wasn't political. I was an ex-crack addict. I didn't know anything about politics, and I was like a, a, somebody with a clean slate that came out of a coma. And anyway, he reached out to me, and I walked in his office in Trump Tower in New York, and, and it was just him and I. And he says, Mike, you always wear your cross. He says, are you a, are you a Christian? I said, yes, Mr. Trump. And this is a divine appointment. And we sat down and talked about the inner city. He said what he was going to do, how he was going to bring the jobs back, and how he was so proud of my pillow having all these jobs here in the USA. And when I walked out of his office, I said, you know what? I don't know much about politics, but this guy's going to be the most pragmatic, greatest president in history. And I talked to his employees, and they were just like talking to my employees. They all loved him. So I went all in. I went all in. I felt that God led me, to, told me to just, you know, go on no matter what the no matter what the cost would be or what the stakes would be. I had people on my board warn me, "You can't do that. You're going to hurt our business." And well, they were kind of right because as soon as I went all in, the Better Business Bureau. And uh, made a thing. I, I, my ads have been running. It was a buy one get one free. And they said, according to our little bylaws, um, you can't run them. Uh, we're going to lower your rating if you uh, if you don't stop running them. And I said, I'm not going to take away my special before Christmas for my customers. And I said, what are you guys talking about? I've been running it for two years, and I'm a, I was up for their torch award, their highest award for customer service in the history of the Better Business Bureau. And they just, it was all political. Them, the truth in advertising.org, the crooked lawyers in California, they all came after my pillow. They did a press release on January 2nd, 2017, after the president won. And I, I was in Toronto, Canada, doing a show, and my phone just blew up. My dad ended up going to the hospital for six months on the same day that every media in this country was waiting. The Better Business Bureau lowered my rating from an A plus to an F over over a buy one get one free for my customers. You know what they told me? I want to I want to put this out there. I've never said this before on any radio. I said, why can't I do this? Well, once you run it for so long, it doesn't. We don't believe it. it then it's not really on sale. I said, everyone in the world says a retail price and a sale price. A manufacturer suggests retail. And they said, well, you're your, own, you're your own manufacturer, Mike. And I said, so if I made it overseas and they told me the regular price or retail price, that that would be okay? And they said, yes. I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I said, everyone in this room should be ashamed. And I said, you just well give me an F because nobody will believe it. And by golly, they did. They went from A plus to an F. I, but you know what that did? Let me tell you. That made my fame in this country tenfold. From that point on, it was a household name. And everyone in this country went after the Better Business Bureau, the Truth in Advertising dot org. Those crooked lawyers in California, they sent letters back to them. People didn't send. Those were they're the ones that bought those pillows. They told they made me send them two hundred thousand testimonials. We sent them two hundred thousand testimonials of all these great things people were saying about the pillow. And they uh and these, and they still came after me for that too. That the testimonials were too good. That they were implied claims, 
and it, it just makes me any anybody any good thing in this country between the lawyers in California and crooked groups like the Better Business Bureau and Truth in Advertising, it's an absolute shame. And that's one of the things that I'm going to fight for the little entrepreneurs in this country to get law changes done and get rid of corrupt groups like that. Michael, thank, thank you, you very, very much. A fantastic <laughs> story. We have similar types of stories. But anyway, thanks for your courage. Thanks for all that you do. And uh, we we, we, we don't, you don't need any more luck because you make your own luck. So when we come back, we're going to the most popular part of our program, which is Ask Robert. For now, Mike Lindell, inventor and CEO of MyPillow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Welcome back. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. You can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android. And all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. Once again, we archive them because repetition is the best way to learn. And this is a very important show, especially for those of you who want to be an entrepreneur. So if you have friends, family, or business associates, especially business associates, listen to it because you never know whose pocket their hands are in. Be very careful. And I want to thank uh, Mike Lindell. Again, he is the inventor and CEO of My, My Pillow. His website is mypillow.com and Mike Lindell, L-I-N-D-E-L-L.com. And I realize we're an international program. And for those of you outside the U.S., he is he is constantly on the air. Very successful man, but he had to he's had to overcome many many personal problems like his addictions, and finally finding religion or Christ to overcome his challenges. Because what happens a lot of times when you become successful, your dark side gets successful also. So you got to be very careful. And we all have addictions. Another thing too is we support people being Republican or Democrat. We're not politically motivated at all, and any religion is fine with us. So we don't support any of those. Right, Kim? That's correct. That's correct. And yeah, I got to tell you, what, you know, talk about perseverance. I mean, this guy, Mike, is so passionate. But the other key is he's not just passionate, he can sell. <laughs> and I would recommend, if you've never seen him, I would go to his website, MyPillow.com, and watch him. I'm sure there's clips there, and you can see. I mean, he's not like this handsome, debonair guy. He's just a regular Joe, and he's just passionate about his product and about helping people. And I think for entrepreneurs, it's a great example of but someone also, that's out there just keeps going. He also going. did say he couldn't sell. He just sat at yeah. sort of the state fairs, and he demonstrated his product. And that's how you learn. You get better and better. You know, it's, a, it's a very interesting word that most academics don't understand is called, you have to make mistakes. You know, you make mistake, you correct, make mistakes, you correct, make mistakes, you correct. But in the real world, it's called practice. You gotta practice. Or in, in theater, it's called rehearsals. And you practice and you rehearse, and you know, Kim has seen me practice and rehearse, practice and rehearse, make mistakes, correct. Get people leave the room and all this, but I, I don't quit. And I think that's really the secret to his success, right? Yeah. Oh, he never quit. Oh, man, he he had so many obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, and he never took no for an answer. And, and you know, the other thing is that people would say this is the way to do it, and he goes, no, that's not the way I'm going to do it because he, he, his, his, he knew his customer and he knew his product. And it's, it's not any different from you, Robert. <laughs> you know your customer. You know your product. And, and what, I, what I appreciate is a lot of these so-called suits, you know, they think that people like myself and Lindell are stupid. And they're the ones who are stupid. They're really stupid people. They're academic types, executive types, corporate types, but they can't, the reason they're that way is because they can't sell. They can't raise capital and they can't do any of that stuff. So they attack people that can. And that's why he's talking about Trump. He's not political, but when he met Trump, you know, Kim and I have worked with the same staff that uh, Mike Lindell is talking about. They're fabulous people. And these people who attack Trump who don't even know them, I have really nothing to say to them. You know, I say, you guys don't even know the guy. You just attack him for whatever reason. Of course, he says, Trump says things he shouldn't say. But other than that, you know, I mean, they just want to attack. So anyway, I remember it was a great show with Mike Lindell. Once again, you can submit your questions to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com. So, Melissa, what's the first question? Our first question today, Robert, comes from Chad in Missouri. Favorite book, Cash Flow Quadrant. He says, I'm starting a business, and my question is, how do you attract investors when starting out? You got to sell, boy. 
You know, you just get knocked down, stand up, knock down, stand up, knock down, and every time you correct, you know, like when Kim and I were trying to raise money for that, um, it was a, our our first big apartment house, con, you know, place in Aloha, Oregon, or something. We got turned down every time a banker turned us down for the money. We just simply said, "So why?" Tell me, okay. So you said no. Why? What aren't we telling you? What do you want to know that we're not? Why did you say no to us? It's the most important question you can ask. Why did you say no? Remember that, Kim? Oh, I remember that well. And we actually did. Go, we actually. We, you just have to go out there, and you gotta. You gotta. They're not gonna come to you. You gotta go to them. And I still remember our friend in Toronto. And we called him, and we sent him the 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 deal. And he said, "I'm in for fifty percent." And he was a really really smart uh, smart real estate guy. And we, but the bankers kept saying no. The bankers kept saying no. But but then too, we when he said yes. We're like, well, he knows he really knows what a good deal is, so this must be a really good deal. So now we're like, we're going to do it ourselves. And so again, we went back to the banks yeah. and we got creative and we just kept talking. Then finally, it was yeah. one of our favorite guys in our whole life. His name is David Riffle. Yeah. David, if you listen to this, bless you, man, <laughs> because he looked down and I made my probably my twentieth presentation. They're all saying no because Kim and I had no money. My my credit rating was in the toilet. Kim was great. Mine was horrible. And they kept saying no. And finally, I remember David. Yep. He sat there at his bank. He pulled open his drawer and he says, well, I can't say yes to you until you fill this form out. Remember that? Oh, yeah. He said, even if I was to consider this, even if we, this, and it's, and it's crazy that I would consider this, you would need to sign this document here. So we signed the document and then he goes, congratulations, you have the money. Yeah. So. And so that's was, really where most people, that's great really education. where most people don't have it. They don't have the ability it's called guts. I don't know what other word to call it. Guts and humility to learn. Well, they turned me down. You know, that's what really upsets me about most of these guys running, running for office. And there's lots of guts to run for political office, but they're all attacking Trump. And I'm going, holy mackerel! You know, I mean, holy mackerel! Well, look at look at Mike Lindell and listen to it, listen to the show again. And he talks about wanting to raise thirty thousand dollars, and he goes into this office with all these suits. And he's, he's pitching, 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 and then he says, "Oh, and by the way, um, I'm I'm not on drugs anymore. I'm I'm not on crack anymore. I was a crack addict, but I'm not anymore." Oh, so how long have you been off crack? Oh, a few days, <laughs> last <laughs> since last Thursday. <laughs> and four guys leave the room, but he got the money. He didn't quit. He kept going. He kept pitching to these other guys that were still in the room, and he got the money. And he That's said he didn't takes. want to be he didn't want to be the CEO. He didn't want to be anything similar to me. I don't want to run the company. But you gotta be very careful because all, you know, I started with a nylon and Velcro surfer wallet business back in the 70s. And almost everybody steals, I hate to say that. You gotta be very careful, you gotta have your checks and balances in there. So it was my CFO, Stanley, the CPA, who stole my money. And then uh, when Kim and I were really successful, we went to very famous accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, they tried to steal our money, and the, I, I sit there and I can't, I can't believe it. These guys are some of the most famous guys on earth, big name corporate guys, and thank God they're out of business in a few years later because they were so corrupt. I can't believe how much pe how many people have to steal today. They're so desperate for money. I just don't understand it. But anyway, that's life. It's what we go through every day. Next question, Melissa. Robert, our next question comes from Evan in Phoenix, Arizona. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He says, my question is how to protect your business. I understand asset protection, and even though you hire attorneys and try to insulate your business, people will try to steal your ideas. What are some of the ways you and Kim protect your businesses? Well, Kim and I, our track record isn't, we're, our track record is much like much because like like yes. we've always hired CEOs and presidents. Because yeah. I don't want to run a company. I, I'm, I like being an entrepreneur, but I'm not an executive. And as I said, starting with my nylon and Velcro surfer ball business in the 70s, the guys I hired all turned out to be crooks. And not that they're crooks, they just, they just see so much money coming in, they can't help themselves because they don't know how to make the money. I think that's the problem. People are so addicted to money, and that's why Mike was talking his addiction to crack cocaine. Everybody's addicted to something, 
And unless you recognize that addiction, then you really can't make it. I mean, I work, you know, I personally work on my addictions a lot because I'm addicted. You know, I, I eat too much, I get nervous, um, I lose my temper at times when I get, a, when I get those, are, those are addictions. So I don't pretend to be perfect and I think that's what really disappoints me when you have these people who sit there smiling with their little, you know, big smiles and they're stealing, the, they're stealing and lying. They don't have the guts to tell you the truth. Any comments on that? <laughs> well, you know, there, you can only do so much to protect your business. I mean, you got the uh, the corporate attorneys, and you do the patents and the trademarks and all. You, but it's a really, especially in the U.S., it's very litigious, litigious. And people, if you have money, people want some of it. Unfortunately, so you can only protect yourself so much. Um, but you just do the best you can. And it's getting worse. You know, the, as as. as yeah. As the national debt and corporate debt rises and all that, people have to make more and more money just to survive. You know, look at this gap between the rich and everybody else. And so when people are struggling just to make, you know, buy food and health care and going to college, people are desperate today. And they could be very nice people, you know, they wear nice clothes and drive nice cars, but people are so desperate because the people that are stealing from us are start at the very top, you know, from our government, the central banks and Wall Street. They've been stealing from us for years and that's kind of why the Rich Dad Company was formed, was to provide people a little bit of financial education to protect yourself from the very people you should be trusting. You know, I mean, look at the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank, they've been, They've been ripping off the world, selling the world these toxic assets called credit default swap, MBSs, uh, CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, and they ripped off the world. And the Fed said, okay, I'll back you up. The, fa the Fed is bankrolling Wall Street along with the U.S. Treasury. And I sit there going and I say, okay, and then I meet these financial planners and well, you should just invest for the long term in the stock market. I'm going, jeez. How can you be so stupid? But most people are. They just want somebody to tell them what to do. Right, Ken? That's what most people just want, the simple answer, the quick fix. Yeah, tell me what to do. Yeah. But as talking to Mike Lindell, you can see there is no quick fix. <laughs> there no. is no magic pill. You just got to get out there. And he, he, to me, is the epitome of the, the street, smart, gritty, persevering entrepreneur. Right. And I love his story. With a big heart. With I mean, a big heart, yes. 1,500 jobs, many of them addicts like him even – hired the crack addicts or are supplying him, <laughs> cleaned them up, story. you know. So there's always something more than money. And I'm afraid most people don't have that other thing that's more important than money. They'll steal from anybody. So with that, once again, I thank Mike Lindell. Thank you for your questions. You can submit your questions to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com.